being addressed, that your messages are being addressed to, to panelists and attendees. Um, and then just as a test, text in or chat in the uh, town that you are uh, tasting from or, or where you are right now. I know most people are in Boston. We have a couple of people spread around though. We've got um, at least one crew up in Maine um, and a couple of people out on the West Coast. Uh, Newton, Lexington, Auburn, Dale, there we go. Lexington, uh, where are you? Good question. This, I've changed my background. This is now Merceau because we're doing white burgundy. So I had to change it to, uh, to Merceau. <laughs> um, good, Newton, 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 Wellesley, awesome. I am not in fact in Merceau as many of you probably gathered. I'm in Boston. <laughs> uh, great, excellent. So I believe we've got, we've got Winetown, USA. All right, that's, that's where I wanna live. <laughs> Maybe someday I hear the, the uh, Georgia. Oh yeah, we have some Southern, Southern uh, tasters joining us too, Georgia as well. Awesome, great. Uh, well, great, let's get started. And again, for those of you who haven't done this before, I want this to be really informal. Um, stop me at any point if I forget something or if I say something that uh, you disagree with or you'd rather you know, hear again or hear differently. Um, there won't be a Q and A at the end, so as the as things occur to you, please chat them in, and and uh, and we can help them join the discussion. And we hope that you'll share tasting notes as you taste through these with us. Um, we can't taste in person, you know, the way that we used to, uh, at least for the moment. Hopefully, we'll, we'll be able to soon. So um, we hope that this will be a good way of of tasting kind of together uh, in a you know in a format where we're where we're uh, where we're together enough to be tasting the same wines at the same time. So it feels like we're together. Um, great, all right, I'm gonna share my screen. Whoops. Let's uh, see. Share my screen here. This one, and we'll start. Anybody can't see the screen? Um, no, good question. I cannot see you guys. <laughs> uh, so you are you are safe. You can you can wear whatever you want. Um, great. So this is a fun tasting. We're, this is the first white tasting we've done this year, um, and it's all going to be white burgundies, and it's all going to be from the Cote d'Or. In fact, next uh, the next tasting we're doing next month is going to be all from Chablis, which is kind of the exception to uh, most white burgundies. There's also the Maconnais and there's also the Cote Chalonnais, but the Cote d'Or is the heart of Burgundy. And so that's where all of the wines we're tasting to, um, the, the, all the wines we're tasting today are gonna be coming from. Um, we're gonna start with Gros uh, in the Oak Cote de Nuit, or I'll pull this map actually, we'll do it. So the Cote d'Or um, is, uh, is the, uh, let's see, the Cote d'Or is the top half of, uh, sorry, the Cote d'Or is right here. <laughs> Burgundy is all in red here, usually I have this, this map of France blown up a little more. So Chablis, which is next month's tasting, is this kind of satellite region right here. Um, but the rest of Burgundy is all together uh, in red along this strip here, basically north-south. The Cote d'Or is the top half of it, or the top third of it. Below it is the Cote Chalonnais, the Maconnais, and then the Beaujolais. Um, and the Cote d'Or is divided into the Cote de Bonne in the south right here, and the Cote de Nuit in the north right here. Um, and in general, the Cote de Nuit is known for its red burgundies, or it's famous for its red burgundies, and the Cote de Bonne is famous for its white burgundies. So uh, to go along with that, the first wine we'll be tasting today is from the Cote de Nuit, but the rest of them, all four of them, th two through five, are from the Cote de Bonne, um, which is typical of where you usually find uh, high-end white burgundies in Burgundy. So we'll be starting off with Michel Gros uh, in an Oak Cote de Nuit Blanc, from the hills kind of to the west of the Cote de Nuit here, but then everything else will be in the Cote de Bonne. We'll be going down to Bourmont in Saint-Aubin and then all the way down to Santenay, which is the just about the last town in the, in the Cote de Bonne going south, and then uh, up to chassagne Morachet for Thomas Moray, and then up to Merceau for Boyer Martineau. Excellent, um, great. Well, let's begin. Um, and as, as I, I'll continue to talk about these and go through them, but I encourage you to to uh, drink them at your own pace and, and enjoy through them at your own pace. They're all whites and actually whites are easier to taste in a bunch like this because you can go back and forth. You don't have to worry about one being much more tannic than the other. They're all, you know, they're all white burgundies. They're all 100% Chardonnay. Um, and actually these will all be from 2018. Um, so really the, the variables that we'll be changing here and that we'll be tasting through are terroir. So the place where the wine comes from and then winemaker style. 
Um, and as we'll talk about, winemaker style plays a, a fairly significant role in, um, in how these wines are made. So Michel Gros is a, a winemaker in Vaughan Romanet, which is this town right here, right in the heart of the Cote de Nuit. And he's best known for his reds from Vaughan Romanet, um, Chambon Musigny, uh, Moray Saint Denis, Nuit Saint Georges, kind of the famous red wine towns throughout here. Um, in fact, he's just started producing a Gervais Chambertin. So he, he will have village wines through, from just about all of the places in the Cote de Nuit um, that are you know, the famous towns. So he also owns a fair amount of real estate. In fact, half of the vines that he owns um, by total vine acreage are in the Haute Cote de Nuit, which is this region here to the west of the Cote de Nuit. Um, and it's a region that has been planted for a long time and making kind of you know, marginally good wines. In good years, they were good. Uh, in kind of tricky years, they weren't as hard. It's a lot higher in elevation, so it's, it's uh, a little harder for the grapes to ripen. Um, and there's a little bit more wind, it's a little bit cooler. Uh, and so it's, you know, historically been a place that, that has made good wines, but not great wines, not wines like the wines down here on the coat. Um, that's changing a little bit in the fact that most of the summers are so much warmer now, uh, and the harvests are so much earlier, that they're not having as much trouble ripening grapes in the Haute Cote de Nuit as they used to. Uh, and so the quality of the wines up here is becoming better. The terroir isn't still isn't the same as you find in these famous Appalachians on the Cote. And so people, you know, it's not like this is going to become the new best wine in this area anytime soon, at least. But um, the wines here are, are getting a lot better and they can often provide really, really good value. Um, Gros makes 11 or 12 different red cuvées. This is his only white cuvée. Um, and it comes from the Haute Cote de Nuit. So the Haute Cote de Nuit is this beautiful hilly region. Um, you can see there's, there, there are the Cote de Nuit all, is just about due east facing vines that kind of change a little bit based on where they are on hills. In the Oco to me, they go all over the place. You can see it's this patchwork of different, different sides, um, different sides of hills and different places, and they plant red and white up here. Um, it's a beautiful region. They also plant higher. Um, you can see that the, in the, in the coat door, the grapes, uh, as we'll see in the pictures coming up, are a lot lower. Um, and so in the Haute Cote de Nuit, they plant higher to kind of give it a little bit of more, more uh, airflow, easier airflow to keep the grapes um, cleaner and drier, um, which is always a trick when you're, when you're growing Chardonnay and Burgundy. Um, so Gros Haute Cote is an interesting wine. Uh, it's technically his Haute Cote Blanc. Uh, it comes from a single parcel called the Fontaine Saint-Martin, which is one of his, he's created what he calls a monopole. Um, monopoles are a big deal on the Cote de Nuit uh, and in the more famous zip codes, they're less of a big deal, but for branding purposes, they're, they're a good idea, I think, uh, in the Oco de Nuit. So it's a vineyard that he owns the whole, the whole percentage of. Um, and so he plants it about half white, half red. Uh, yes, steel cement use, I will get to that. So all of these wines have, are raised in some oak. Um, so we'll be playing with varying degrees of oak. Um, Grose is interesting in that he actually, uh, very unusually for white burgundy, lets it after, so, so he, he presses um, and once the, once the grapes are harvested for this wine, they're, they're brought to the winery and half of them are pressed and the juice is come, comes off uh, and then the ferment, juice is just fermented on its own. And that's the way most white wine is made. Um, half of them are destemmed. Uh, the other half is destemmed and crushed and then actually left on the skins overnight for about a day or maybe 12 hours, depending on the vintage. Uh, and so skin contact in fermentation in white wines in Burgundy is not usual. And technically it's a Vin de Masteration or what people call orange wines. Um, it's not really an orange wine, as you can see it. It only is on the skins for not very long and Chardonnay doesn't have um, the pigment that usually, that, that orange wines are often made from grapes with, with darker pigment in the skin. So you don't end up with an orange wine, but it is a little bit of a maceration, which is unusual. Um, and it's actually a way that Burgundy used to be made more often. Um, gotten away from that a little bit and grow kind of, you know, just does it for half of the half of the cuvee um, and blends it in as he makes a as a, a blend of the two different styles. It's kind of an old style and it his his white is, it's funny, he tells us his white, this wine is the only wine that keeps him up at night. He has, you know, 12 different other reds that are much more, you know, pricier and and higher stakes and uh, tricky and, and uh, you know, come from different places and have old vines and are prone to maladies and different things. And the white is the one that he feels like he's very comfortable making red wines, but white wines are the ones he's, he has a little trouble. He feels like he's very trouble making, but I think as you'll see, not too much trouble. So this is about 20% new oak, depending on the year. Um, and so 
usually wine is, uh, is raised in oak barrels um, that are either new or have been used before. And if they're new, the first year that they use, they impart a lot of oak flavor. Um, they're actually toasted on the inside. Uh, and so the, they give a little kind of a smoky vanilla oaky flavor to them. And when, if you taste a lot of wines from uh, the new world, at least as of the last you know, 20 years, more, new world wines have a lot more, often have a lot more oak than you find in Burgundy. Um, that's a generalization, but in general, New World Chardonnays are known for having much more, much more uh, obvious use of oak. Um, and the way they do that is they use exclusively new barrels or they use a higher percentage of new barrels. Um, so when you use a barrel that's already been used, you get a little bit of oak flavor, but you don't get a, a, a huge amount of oak flavor and you get a little bit of micro oxygenation, which kind of lets the wine breathe and let it soften a little bit. So. For this wine, he uses 20% new, uh, depending on the year, 15 or 20% new, and then 80% uh, old oak barrels. So it's nice. It has a has, you can you can see the oak there, but it's not hitting over the head. It's kind of a nice like creaminess in the wine, like a like a like sweet cream, like vanilla cream, like an ice cream flavor almost. Got good length, really nice acidity actually for the amount of width that it has. The balance, the, the trick in white burgundy is always to balance the richness of the grape. Chardonnay can be very, very high in alcohol and very kind of viscous and round and soft. And so when you go too far in that direction, you get a wine that's out of balance and ends up being kind of heavy and, and flat. Um, if you don't have enough of that, you get a wine that's kind of thin and, and acidic. So balancing the acidity and the richness is what white winemakers in white burgundy are always trying to to strive to do. Yeah, I I, I kind of like the way that the the toast is playing into it. It's a it grows. He actually has a has a heavier toast on the inside of his barrels than most people do, um, and somewhat contradictorily, that gives the wine more of a toast flavor. It actually imparts less oak flavor. Um, so the more you toast, the more you char the inside of a barrel. The less oak flavor it gives the wine, but the more kind of smoky, toasty flavor. And you can definitely, you can see that toastiness in it. It's not quite as buttery vanilla as a New World Chardonnay. There's definitely that note. You, you wouldn't call this a, an unoaked wine. Nice, nice kind of white floral note to it too. I should say the, the um, place where it is, if you look geologically, just off the bottom of this map at the, at the top of the Cote de Bone, is the Hill of Corton, which is known uh, for its white Corton Charlemagne, which is a grown cru, which is the highest it gets in Burgundy. Um, and they found geologically, actually, that there's a seam of the same geological pattern of mineral content that runs under the Hill of Corton, uh, so where Corton Charlemagne is made, and right through the oak coat here, kind of on a on a uh, you know a, a little band of the same type of of, of uh, minerals in the soil. So um, we we often white flowers are often something that people find in Corte Charlemagne. And while you definitely wouldn't mistake this for Corte Charlemagne, you get a little bit of that nice floral kind of softness to the wine. If anyone has tasting notes, I uh, encourage you to chat them in. Um, but I'm going to move on to wine too, so we have something to compare. It's always better, I find, to compare two wines. And what we'll do is we'll kind of do the first three, and I have a poll for you, and we'll talk about those, and then we'll do the second two, because they're on kind of different, uh, different different planes, at least by classification. Lovely fruit, poor palate, white flowers, such citrus minerals. Yeah, it's nice, I, 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 nice, it's, the wine is in nice balance right now, I think. Okay, so for wine two, uh, let's see, how long has the area been talked about? Good question. So yeah, I'm moving all over the place here. Um, if you go, let's see. Um, I don't think I have scales on any of these. Uh, I can give you driving scale. <laughs> uh, it takes about a half hour to drive from, um, let's see, if you, were on, if you were on the main road, not on this, on the auto route that runs out here where you can go very, very fast and you have to go very fast to keep up with everybody. Uh, from Bone to drive up to um, Nuit Saint-Georges is maybe 20 minutes. Um, so this is not terribly far. 
ter terribly far away. It's just, you know, it's a slow road uh, because it's so small. Um, but the Cote d'Or is really, is quite a small area. Um, and really, even on an auto route, it would only take an hour or so to drive from one end to the other. Um, okay, so we're going to move south to the Cote de Bone. And the Cote de Bone is where we'll be for the last four wines of this tasting. And those are, that's kind of the heart of where white Burgundy is from. And we're moving to uh, Premier Cru. So in Burgundy, there are four classification levels. There's regional, um, which is the broadest, um, which is what the first wine is. There is village wine, where you can name it after the individual village. Um, and then there's Premier Cru, which is uh, all from a single, vines all from a single village and from a single plot. Um, and uh, that are a classification up from, from village level, that's Premier Cru. And then the highest is Grand Cru, which is just like Premier Cru. It's all in the same village, all in the same little plot, um, but it's the it's an elevated version of Premier Cru. So Grand Cru is the highest they get in, in Burgundy. And Premier Cru, this one uh, that we're tasting, is the second from the highest. Um, and this is from a town called Saint-Aubin. And Saint-Aubin is interesting because it is... Uh, so I'm going to, yeah, for this one, <laughs> I'll tilt the map here. This is how the map actually looks um, with Santenay, Chassagne, Pouligny, Saint-Aubin, and Merceau going like this. I'm going to tilt it this way just because this blown up map here to read correctly uh, has to be tilted that way. So we're moving this way. So this goes kind of north off the top of this and south off the bottom of this. Um, but Saint-Aubin is this interesting valley that runs out between these two very, very famous towns of chassagne Montrachet and Pouligny Montrachet. And you can see those here on the bottom of this map. Chassagne is right here and Pouligny is right here. And they have a border that runs right through the middle of what most people consider the finest white wine vineyard in the world, Montrachet, or the Montrachet, the collection of different Montrachet wines. You can see both of these towns in the 30s named their town name after Montrachet. They put it on there as a marketing move. Um, Montrachet is, I think, undisputedly the greatest white wine vineyard in the world. Just up the valley from it uh, is Saint-Aubin, which is right here. And it's kind of tucked away in a valley, but the, but the vines actually extend all the way to the border with Chassagne-Montrachet here and Pouligny-Montrachet here. And particularly right along the border, um, there are very, very fine wines and, and you know, really excellent terroir. You can see that the, the distance from here to here is very, very close, a couple hundred meters from here to here. Um, and, you know, these border some very, very famous Premier Cru vineyards in Chassagne and Pouligny. So Saint-Aubin is never has had the same cachet as Chassagne and Pouligny. Um, and for a very long time, it was a really, really good source of value. Um, as with most things in Burgundy, uh, value is even harder to find now than it always has been. <laughs> uh, and so Saint-Aubin has, it, you can't really say Saint-Aubin is not discovered or is undiscovered anymore. Um, it's still tucked away in a valley, but people, you know, because of the demand for white Burgundy and Burgundy in general, people have found Saint-Aubin and the prices have gotten bidden up. So it's not nearly the, the deal it once used to be, um, but the wines are still really good. Uh, and it's still, you can, you know, still doesn't command quite the same uh, prices as Premier Cruz in particular from Chassagne and Pouligny. Um, so the wine we're going to be tasting today is from this vineyard right here, Merger des Dents de Chien, which means walls of dog's teeth. Um, and that is a reference to the shape of the very sharp stones in the vineyard, uh, which looks like look like dolls, dog's teeth. Um, and as you can see topographically, this is a valley right through here. Um, and so there's Chassagne on one side of the valley and Pouligny on the other. And I'll show you, I think, the, yeah, the next slide after this is a picture that I have taken in Merger de Donnichia, the, the vineyard for this wine, looking due south towards Chassagne. So you'll see, you get to see a little bit of the topography um, so this is standing, this is this, the vineyard right here. You can see all these very sharp, sharp uh, looking stones on the left. Um, and this is Saint-Aubin off to the right here. And then if you, so there's a little bit of a dip and then you see uh, chassagne Montrachet is the town right here. Um, so it's much higher in elevation, um, which is part of the reason the terroir isn't quite as perfect as it is in Montrachet. Um, and it is a little bit removed, but it's very, very close to these very famous uh, vineyards. And so we think we still think, you know, even despite people finding it and the price is getting bid up, Merger de Don Chien and Enremi, these two in particular, these two right here, Merger is kind of up on the top and Enremi is on this sloping downhill that faces south, um, are often some of the best premier crews in Saint-Aubin. Um, and then this, yeah, if you turned 90 degrees to the right, you would see this, which is the village of Saint-Aubin, beautiful little village um, nestled in this nice uh, valley that runs off between the two Famous towns. Okay, enough talking. <laughs> you can taste the wine now. So the interesting thing about this wine too is that is the winemaker. It's our newest winemaker in Burgundy. 
Um, and it's a winemaker that's a little bit of an enigma. We don't really know where she came from or where, <laughs> where she's been hiding for all this time. She makes really terrific wine and she has a lot of different wines, uh, a lot of different um, properties around the Cote de Bone a little bit in the Cote de Nuit too, but mostly around the Cote de Bonne. She's right in Merceau, which is a town we'll get to a little later. Um, this is the, this is one of, this is her, her winemaker. She, she, she is a winemaker and then she is this enologist or this kind of cellar master, she refers to him, Dimitri, who is the guy who, the two of them make these wines together. She, her name is Sophie Bormann and um, she's Belgian. Uh, she started the demand in 2002 uh, and she spends a lot of time in both Belgium and in Bone or in, in the Cote de Bone. So Dimitri is there full time. Um, and we found these wines in a restaurant in Bone and really loved them, both the reds and the whites. Uh, and it took us forever <laughs> to try to uh, get in touch and, you know, track them down. And that's, you know, the norm in Burgundy when you're trying to find new producers, particularly today, is that people just don't need new importers to sell to in general. Um, so it, it was, there was a fair amount of persistence involved. Um, we finally made contact and were able to track them down um, and taste it with wine, taste it with them and the wines really showed they were as good as, as we had found them in restaurants. Um, their style is quite low oak and I think you'll see, yeah, there's, I would say there's less oak apparent than in the grow. The, it's a little bit more, a little bit less, um, the fruit is a little different. I would say it's kind of a drier fruit. Uh, maybe a little bit more savory, a little bit more kind of herbal. Not overtly herbal. There's definitely fruit there and there's nice minerality to it too. But um, the oak, I would say, is less. So the toastiness in the oak is less. That's on purpose too. They, they use at the maximum 15% new oak for any of their wines. Um, so most of it is old oak. And they actually use very particular oak barrels for their, for their wines. They use barrels that are Austrian and French. And they use barrels, they found a barrel maker that will custom make barrels from extremely old trees. Uh, and apparently with particularly old trees, the pores on the wood are smaller and finer. And so there's even less uh, development of oak you know, that's imparted into the wine for older wood barrels, you know, it's burgundy. So there's, there's just, there's no end to the variables you can apply to the wines. Yeah, I think the wine, this is, this is kind of less round and soft than the grow. It doesn't have the flowers I think I was getting in the grow. But it has a longer finish. Yeah, it has kind of a, a kind of a more, a more concentrated core to it. Yeah, there's something about the nose that's, that's quite different from the grow. I'm fine. Please comment in and tell me if you think, tell, tell me if you think this is all wrong. <laughs> For me, it's kind of a classier, uh, it's just a little bit, a little bit more reserved, a little more polished, a little bit less kind of exuberant than the grow is a little bit more, um, a little more, they would say in French, droit, which means straight. Uh, it's a little bit straighter, <laughs> a little bit less, uh, a little bit more kind of in line. Coconut on the nose, I totally agree. I was just gonna say that. Yes, thank you, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, coconut for sure. And not the kind of, you know, big, soft, rich, uh, uh, like exotic coconut you get in, in Burgundy sometimes, um, but the specific spice of coconut, usually coconut comes with, you know, mango and acacia and pineapple, lots of other things like in Viognier or in a big Merceau or in a Chassagne even. But this one, I think I, I'm getting like just specifically coconut meat. <laughs> Spun cotton candy. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Yeah, there's a nice, there's a term in French for, for the taste of sugar without the feel of sugar, um, which is sucrosité. It's when, it's when you have wine that, that tastes like sugar tastes, but doesn't taste sweet. Um, and I definitely, definitely see a little bit of that in, in that. No, not the pink label on this one. This one's label is white. Uh, this one right here. And um, I should say, actually, if you like this style, they make a Bourgogne, a, a simple Bourgogne that's about half the price of this or maybe not quite half the price, but it's, it's, it's somewhere in the 30s um, and is a lovely, lovely everyday wine. It doesn't have the length that this does, doesn't have the intensity, um, but is a really nice, nice everyday wine. Um, great. All right, so let's move to three. 
so for three, we're moving down south. We've gone from up here uh, to Saint Aubin, right here. And remember, we're turning this back so it's north off the top and south off the bottom. Um, so Poligny here and Chassagne here, Saint Aubin off the off the uh, valley here to the west. Um, whoops, oops. I seem to have lost you guys. Hang on. There we go. Am I sharing a screen again? I think I am. Okay. Um, at the very southern end of the Cote, of the Cote de Bone. Uh, is Sontenay. It's actually Marange, which is the very, very last town. Um, but the very last town that produces white, or much white, is Sontenay, which is right here. And it's the town that's just south of chassagne Morochet. This particular vine, this particular wine comes from Beauregard, um, which is this uh, vineyard right here. Um, so you can see just at the north, and again, we've turned, we've turned so north is off the top of this. <laughs> um, this is chassagne Morochet here. So uh, the very southern end of Chassagne is the border right here. And then you get to La Combe and Beauregard, which are two very, and Gravier and Tavan. These are kind of the best, I would say the best four, or best, best known four um, Premier Cruz in Sontenay. And they produce both red and white. Beauregard uh, is the one we're tasting today and it produces white. And this is actually quite up high up on the hill. The vines that they have are right here near the forest. So this is Beauregard, but it's a fairly large vineyard. So it's upslope Beauregard. And another totally different nose in this, interestingly. Sanjane, I would say at its, at its uh, this is a Premier Cru as well. Um, Sanjane doesn't have the same cachet, even as Saint Aubin, the wine number two um, that we just tasted has. Uh, it's a little bit more of a, uh, just of an everyday style. Um, for me, Sanjane, you know, if it, particularly if it's red and you age it nicely, can rival village level Chassagne. Um, and actually, you know, in the right year, village level Chassagne versus Sontenay Premier Cru White, you, I think you can make an argument. There's there's some similarities there. Um, has to be the right year, and Sontenay just doesn't have the same terroir of Chassagne or Poligny. Um, but that said, it has, I think, pretty excellent terroir. And with you know people making better wine everywhere in Burgundy these days, um, Sontenay is a nice place for value. Um, this is Roger Bello on the left, who's the winemaker. Um, he makes a whole bunch of reds and a whole bunch of whites. I think he makes 15 or 16 different cuvées, all from different places. Um, he makes a white Beauregard, which we're tasting now. He also makes a red Sontenay Beauregard. Um, both are delicious. Uh, he makes a Morange, he makes a Chassagne, Poligny, Merceau, every, basically everywhere in the Côte de Bonne, he makes it. His style is to make wines that are fruit forward, um, not wines to age forever. Um, they often have a nice richness to them. Uh, and they often have a nice kind of floral quality. They're almost always approachable pretty young too. Um, anise in the nose, menthol. Yeah, I agree. I was picking up a kind of a smokiness almost or like an ash in this nose um, that I think is really cool. It's, it has it has some herbs that the others haven't had. Um, although it has nice, I think the fruit is, is really there. It's not kind of like a, a just a dry savory one. I like the fruit in it too. Yeah, and, and in the mouth is interesting. It's kind of bigger and rounder to start, but finishes a little shorter than the Bormann, the number two, which I think is a little bit more persistent. It's kind of less opulent to begin with, but a little bit longer, a little more persistent. Toasted marshmallow. Oh, these are good. You guys are you guys are on a roll today. <laughs> interesting to go back and forth between the two, uh, between two and three. There isn't the same concentration I'm finding in the Sontenay that there is in the in the um, Saint Aubin, but the the nose is almost easier for me to like now. I, I like whatever that 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 uh, menthol or you know herbal note that everyone is picking up here. I think it's really fun. Good potential development. Yeah, I, I agree. I think these wines, the problem with Bellon's wines is they're so drinkable young <laughs> that no one ever ages them. Um, but every time we, you know, we have a case in the back of Depot that, that we find that we think, oh shoot, I forgot that was there. Or, you know, it looked like it was empty. And so we just left it and there's a bottle or two of what should be, you know, too old Roger Bellon. Um, we open it, the wine's spectacular, particularly with reds, but with whites too. We've had whites the, the Chassagne Premier Cru. So the, the Bella's most famous vineyard is this one right here, actually just over the border into, um, into Chassagne. And he actually produces wine from Lacombe, from Beauregard and from Gravier, um, and then from others over here too. He's, he's just got vines everywhere. 
um, but this is his premier cru, uh, Clos Pitois, which is a monopole, meaning he owns the whole thing. Um, and that one I think ages particularly well. Um, it has more intensity than, the, than this one we're trying, but a very similar fruit herb mineral profile to it. Okay, let's uh, do a poll. We'll see what everyone thinks of these first three. And then we're gonna move to, um, let's see how I do this. Yeah, we'll move to two more famous names, whoops. Okay, so we'll vote on just which of your, which was your favorite of the first three. And as you're doing this, I'll just say that 2018 was an unusual year in Burgundy. Um, it was much hotter than it usually is. Um, usually it takes a hundred days to ripen, uh, to ripen grapes. It's, you know, the, from the flowering to the harvest is usually a hundred days. Um, in 2018, it was 80 days. So it's 20% faster because it was so hot and so dry uh, and the grapes just progressed so fast. Um, they had something like 30% more sunlight hours than they usually have. So it really changed the character of the vines of the wines. And actually 2019 and 2020 were not that dissimilar. They weren't quite ex as extreme as 18, but they were, you know, pretty hot and pretty dry. Uh, so, and, and yields were kind of low too. So, you know, people are wondering if maybe this is just, you know, what Burgundy tastes like now. Um, what's interesting is that in 2018, uh, particularly for the whites, there was a ton of water, a ton of rain in the um, winter before the season, the growing season. Um, and so the grapes were, it was hot and the grapes progressed very fast, but they actually weren't dehydrated. In 2003, for instance, there was, it was almost as hot as in 2018, but uh, they also had a drought beforehand so that you ended up with kind of raisins essentially at the end of the growing season. There was just no water in the soil and the vines really struggled to produce any kind of juice. Uh, 2018 was saved by a pretty wet winter and spring. Um, but you know, that's, that's gonna be the trick going forward. Um, can I vote twice? Let's see, we've got two, then three, then one. Can I vote twice? I'm afraid Jeff, you can't vote twice. <laughs> um, if, you, if, if I could figure out how to have Zoom do, let you do that, I would. All right, so we've got votes for everybody here. I'll share the results. We've got seven votes for the Sancenay, eight votes for the Oak Coat, and 15 for the Bormont. So a clear winner in the Saint-Aubin, um, but favorites all around, so that's good. Well, that's, that's what we like to see. All right, so I'm gonna go back to these two and we'll move, oops, let's see, am I sharing? I'm not sharing, hang on. Okay, so we're gonna share the screen again. Okay, so one was off the top of this map. That's kind of the outlier in the, in the Cote de Nuit, the Haute Cote de Nuit. Then we move down to two in Saint-Aubin right here, the one that's sandwiched between Chassagne and Poligny, the two famous towns. Three, we went all the way down to Saint-Genet. And again, by all the way down, this takes, you know, you could you could walk from the center of Chassagne into the center of Saint-Genet in a half hour. So driving, it takes five minutes. Uh, this is all very, very zoomed in. Um, it's a good note though. Next time I'll, I'll make sure we have a scale here because this really is a very, very small region. Um, so now we're moving up from Saint-Genet to chassagne Morche itself. Um, and this is wine number four. So hang on just a second, I'm moving my glasses around. So wine number four is the Chassagne Marche, and it's interesting because it's the first wine that we've had so far, I believe. Yeah. So all of the first one came from the single plot in the Oak Coat. Uh, all of the second one came from the single Premier Cru, the Merger de Don de Chien. Number three all came from Beauregard, the, the, the um, vineyard in Saint-Tenay. Four is actually a blend of seven different plots around the town of chassagne Um, Most of them are on the north side of the town, so closer to the Poligny border. Um, but that is kind of a traditional way that at the village level, um, so we've moved down a level too in, in terms of the, the classification. At the village level, it's been traditional for winemakers to make a cuvee that represents the town as a whole. Um, or what they see as their terroir as a whole. And so they'll blend certain different plots from around uh, chassagne Morche in this case, to achieve what they think of as an expression of the town, rather than with the first few, the expression of a single vineyard site. Um, and it's a little bit going out of favor, uh, or is a little bit out of favor now to, to do this, um, because you know there's so much concentration on Burgundy and there's so many people paying attention 
um, people are just, you know, getting ever smaller and more, uh, you know, more nuanced and, and paying more attention to the little micro differences between this plot versus this plot versus this plot. Um, and so it's more in vogue now to make, even at the village level, wines that are of a single, or from a single vineyard. Um, but, uh, and the other thing about that is, is they're finding now with, with geology, they have geologists doing, you know, very, very detailed looks at villages um, and where, you know, where, what, what is it under a Premier Cru that makes it a Premier Cru versus a village versus a Grand Cru. Um, and they're finding that, you know, the limits of the villages are, they make some sense in terms of where the terroir shifts, but they're not perfect. So in a lot of ways, the terroir, um, you know, making individual plots from different parts of the town uh, is a way it is it kind of blurs the the expression of the terroir. That was if you if you didn't like the way he was doing it. I actually am a fan of this of, of both of the styles. I think there's there's a place for both of them, and particularly with Thomas Moret, he's blending all of these wines from the from the north side of Chassagne. So he's really taking kind of an expression of a part of the town um, and making a a, um, a cuvee that represents a place um, that is broader than a single plot, but not you know, not a region-wide thing where you're blending stuff from Merceau all the way to Santenay, you know, to Saint Romain, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's my spiel on this. <laughs> uh, okay, so Thomas More is a wonderful winemaker. Um, this is him here. He's a very, uh, very precise winemaker um, and a very precise person. <laughs> uh, he's very kind of, you know, sharply dressed, uh, wire rim glasses, uh, everything he does is very neat. His tasting room and his cellar, for that matter, are, you know, eat off the floor clean. Um, he's just a very precise, very neat, orderly person. Um, and his wines are a perfect reflection of that character of the man himself. Um, he's, a, he's a wonderful winemaker. His, wine, his vines um, in Saint-Aubin and Chassagne and Santenay and a little bit in Pelini Marche too. And so this is the village level Chassagne that is uh, a representation of the, of the village as a whole. So it's seven different plots blended together. His style is um, pretty low in oak. Let's see, he uses, yeah, 15, depending on the year, sometimes 20% 20, 20 new oak, um, but that's actually for his, for his Grand Cruz. So for the Premier Cruz and village wines, it's probably more like 15 or 10% new oak. Um, so his style is to pick pretty early, um, which means the wines retain their acidity. It has, his style is to, even at the Grand Cru, not to have a ton of big, rich, opulence to the wine. Um, they're, they're always full of tension. They're always um, very precise, very clean. Oak is not the point of any of these wines. They're raised in oak because if you didn't raise it in oak, it wouldn't really taste like Chassagne. That's the, the classic expression of Chassagne. But oak is always a supporting character in, in Thomas More's wines. And he, I think he's one of the better winemakers in terms of how he uses oak because he just is so careful with it. And it's always there, always in exactly the right amount. He's the 10th generation Moray to be making wine in Chassagne Marche, which is hard to wrap your head around. Um, and he took over for, or he, he, he and his brother split his father's domain, which is the domain Bernard Moray, which is a quite well-known domain in Chassagne um, in 2000, 2006 was the last Bernard Moray year. So 2007 was his first year. So you can see the nose, it's a different, it's a, it's a different animal. And actually, because we took a break there to do the poll, go back and smell the first couple just to see them, to put yourself in the in context. And in particular, the, the Santenay, number three, which is the next town down. So we're moving from Santenay to Chassagne. And when you get to Chassagne, there's just kind of another level of depth to the wine. beautiful. There's just, there's a nice, there's the fruit that's there, but it's kind of reserved fruit, and there's just a really nice intensity to the nose. Same thing in the mouth. There's just more intensity. There's more wine there. It's incredible how he's able to pack energy into such a kind of a compact form. Um, you know, if you have all of this energy that these grapes are producing, it's easy to produce a big, rich, you know, round wine that kind of fills the mouth. And somehow he, he produces a wine that is full of that energy, but he's channeling it into a much narrower form kind of right across the center of your palate. A 
let's see. We've got Shasanya Elegance and Balance. Yeah, I think this drink's, I, I agree, brilliant for a village. I, the village, I'm, I'm amazed. Yeah, this, uh, he's, <laughs> it's showing well. C3 again in light of four. Yeah, actually, particularly now that we have four, now that we've gone to this one, taste three and two, actually, because two is, you know, the other one right next to Shasanya two. <laughs> and again, same vintage for all these. So vintage in Burgundy plays a lot of, what could be a huge, a hugely uh, confounding variable, I guess they say. Um, but in this tasting, at least it's not. Uh, this is, this tasting is uh, all 2018 different harvest dates. And Thomas More is almost always the first among the people we talk to to pick um, because he's so careful and meticulous about not having overripe grapes. The, the grapes have to be ripe because they have to have sugar, which turns into alcohol. They have to taste ripe to have the flavors be correct. But if you let them get too ripe, you lose acidity and you lose um, energy. Uh, and I think this is a really nice example of energy in a wine without compromising Material. Yeah, the Santa going back and forth. The Santa is really nice. The Santa is is nice next to it. They're they're wildly different. <laughs> An interesting number two uh, has, I would say a kind of similar shape to number four, but not nearly as much packed into it. So it has a kind of, a kind of, you know, concentrated form, um, but just not the length that the, that the, that the Shasanya has, not the, just not the, the um, muscle that Shasanya has that's kind of wound up into it. Okay, finally. We're moving two more towns up. We're skipping Poligny Morochet because I had to do five. Uh, and actually, I was going to put a Poligny in this, but I didn't have enough of any of my Polignys <laughs> to pour to <at> tasting. <laughs> so uh, we, we're skipping over Poligny, which is something you should never do, um, but we're going to do here. And we're going up to Merceau. So Chassagne, we've gone from Santenay to the next town up, Chassagne. Um, Saint Aubin is the one that's kind of off to the west. Poligny would be the next town if you were walking or biking, which when you're allowed to do again, I highly recommend you do. And then you get to Merceau, and Merceau is enormous. Um, I think I have the map is next. Yeah, so this is Poligny Morochet here on the left. We've now again turned this 90 degrees. So this is north off the right side and south off the left side. Um, Merceau is the size of, by land, Chassagne Morochet and Poligny Morochet put together. Um, so it's a huge appellation. Uh, it stretches all the way from the Poligny border all the way up to the other side of the town of Merceau to the Volnay border right here. It's like 400, 400 hectares. I forget exactly how many. It's an enormous, enormous place. Um, and I actually have even cut it off here because I wanted to, to zoom in a little bit more on this. Um, it has, as you would imagine for a town that covers so much ground, vastly different expressions of terroir based on where you are. Um, it curiously has no grown crews. Um, so Chassagne Morochet and Poligny Morochet both share the famous series of Grand Cru's around Montrachet. Um, Merceau has no Grand Cru's. It has premier Cru's that are kind of would-be Grand Cru's that are particularly well respected. They're all collected down here at the southern end, Genevrier, Perrier, and Charme. These three are kind of the, and, and Perrier in particular, um, you know, a half head above the rest of these. Uh, these three and Perrier in particular are kind of thought of as the best Premier Cruz in Merceau, but none of them reach, and I think probably none of them will ever reach, Grand Cru level. Um, so it's an interesting town. It has very, very high average level of wine that comes out of it, um, partially because it, it, you know, it, it covers so much ground. So there's so many different expressions all over the place. And because it covers so much ground, people have a tendency, winemakers here have a tendency to, uh, to really concentrate on making um, you know, individual cuvées from individual plots. Because as you can imagine, a wine from here tastes totally different from a wine from here, which tastes totally different from wine from over here or over here. Um, and so people make Merceaux that are blends of different plots, but it's 
particularly common in Merceau to have single vineyard, even at the village level, blends. Um, so let's see. Uh, Muscat finish. Oh, good. I like that. <laughs> uh, so the wine we're tasting is from Narvo, which is right here, right along the, um, it, it kind of borders the famous Premier Cruz, the Genevieve right here. Um, and it stretches all the way up to where the forest starts right here. Um, it's about the highest elevation point in Merceau. Um, I think I might have written down. I did not write down how high it is. It's high. <laughs> uh, if you stand up here, you have a beautiful view over, you know, the coat going this way and the coat going this way. Um, but it's a much different terroir than you find down here. There's much more mineral in the soils. There's much more clay down here on the flat. Um, and so the wines up here in Merceau make a uh, much more kind of, uh, a much more tension-filled expression of Merceau. Um, and the wines down here on the flat make a more kind of big, soft, round expression of Merceau. Um, so the one we're tasting today is Narvo, uh, and it's generally Narvo and TA, uh, probably Narvo is probably considered the best Premier Cru spot, or the best, excuse me, village level spot in, um, in Merceau. The winemaker is Y.A. Martin, who's this guy in the middle here. Um, and he has a really interesting regime. He has plots all over Merceau. He makes, let's see, he makes an Ormo uh, right here. He makes Narvo, he makes TA. Um, he makes a blend of a couple different ones over here. And then he has Premier Cruz in all three of the famous ones, uh, Perrier, Genevieve, and Charme. And actually he has some extremely famous Premier Cruz in Bligny too. Um, so he's got very good real estate. He's a very, very good winemaker. His style, I think you'll see, is totally different um, from the last few we had partially because uh, just, you know, of, of the styling that he makes. He uses a little bit more new oak than the ones we've been trying, but not a ton. He's still only 25% new oak. These are from 50-year-old vines, so they're older than the vines we've been trying, uh, and as vines age, they uh, their yield goes down, um, but the quality generally goes up uh, of the wine, so people, you know, when you get to 50 years old, the wine is, the grapes, the vines are producing a lot fewer grapes or fewer bunches, but they are uh, the the quality of them is more concentrated and so you get less juice per vine um, and per acre, but the, the intensity of the juice is higher. Um, so we're combining that with Merceau. Merceau is typically a big soft, not soft, a big rich kind of opulent style of wine, a little bit like Chassagne, but, but kind of even more, uh, I don't know, even broader. Chassagne has a kind of a high and low note going at the same time. Merceau is just kind of everything at the same time, or that's the classic if you were going to draw a single expression from the vineyard. Um, increasingly in recent years, as the style that people are looking for has shifted more towards balance, people have been, you know, picking a little earlier, adding a little bit more acidity to their Merceaus, adding a little bit more, uh, you know, and by I say adding acidity, I mean crafting them into having more acidity. Uh, There's just kind of a fresher style of Merceau now than there used to be 20 years ago. Uh, but Merceau still is, you know, big, big, soft, um, round wines. Can't believe the same grape as the first four. I agree. <laughs> this one's totally different. This, this confounded us when we were tasting this at the at the warehouse this morning. This is the the town of Merceau, and this is actually from this is taken from TA uh, or below TA. It's not even as high as TA. So I'll go up here. This is taken right here. I guess it's in Castet, which means broken heads. <laughs> Uh, or, or hit heads. Um, right here uh, is where, yeah, I think I was, I was, I, think I drove along here and climbed up into this area here. That's where this picture is taken. So you can see it kind of slopes down. Um, the, vine, the wine you're drinking is from up behind where this is, um, but much, much higher on the, on the slope. The big difference in the elevation of this wine, I think is probably what people are noticing or picking up on this. Um, which is these eggs. So Vincent does everything kind of, you know, way other, the way the rest of the, these four that we've tasted does, um, the rest the way they do it, they, you know, ferment the grapes, uh, put them in oak, bottle them, uh, and then release them. Vincent uh, does the fermentation, puts it in oak for a year, 25% new oak for this wine. And then instead of bottling it, he puts it in these eggs for a whole other year. Um, so he releases it 12 months later, um, and in these eggs, he leaves it on what are called leaf fine, which are the very, very fine leaves. So it's not filtered um, and it's not on, you know, the skins or the, the dead yeast cells, um, but it's on the kind of sediment that comes out of wine if you don't filter it or if you don't pump it off. So over the course of the year, this wine generally circulates in these large concrete eggs 
which look like spaceships. <laughs> uh, and, and I think what you're seeing, what I'm seeing here is, uh, particularly in the mouth, the, the kind of broadness and softness of this wine, the kind of enveloping character that the wine has across the palate, uh, I think is largely due to this extra year that he does in the eggs. And it's funny, he only just started doing this. 2017 was the first year he introduced them and he only did half of this crop. So he did half of the crop out of the eggs and half the crop in the eggs and actually did two separate bottle releases for 17. 18, which is the one we're drinking, it's the first year where everything has gone into the eggs. Um, and he feels that his wines are just better if people start drinking them another year after the harvest. Um, they certainly can age quite a bit longer than that, but he feels that they are readier for market. He doesn't want people to be drinking them before that. And so we asked him why he doesn't just bottle them and then keep the bottles there. And he said that, that, that the evolution is too fast in those. And so what, he's, what these are doing is kind of giving it a very, very slow evolution, not stopping the evolution, but giving it just kind of another 12 months of rest before the wine is bottled and then kind of released into, you know, into people uh, enjoying it. Mm, yeah. Rounder. There's le there's almost less acidity. I think there is less acidity in the wine. There's more. There's more. Um, it's not out. It's not lacking acidity, but there's there's less uh, kind of it, the wine. It seems maybe a little kind of um, more relaxed. <laughs> um, there's a little bit more. Uh, it's definitely softer and definitely more mouth filling. Definitely, the texture is totally different between four and five. Four is more kind of pointed and 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 piercing. Five is just you know luscious and and soft and rich. It's not lacking acidity because acidity is there, but it's just not as it, it kind of doesn't taste as young to me, which I guess is the point <laughs> uh, as the as the uh, Shasanya. Very interesting to go back and forth between four and five. They're two wildly different styles, um, and they're you know fifteen minutes apart from where they're made. Uh, and they're both at the village level. They're both twenty eighteen, um, but you know, kind of taking what they're doing and going in totally different, totally different uh, styles. Hmm. It's very cool. Um, Dill. Oh, that's a good one. Let me see. Oh, totally. I can see that. Yeah, there's definitely, there's a, there's a, like an herbal, almost like a, I'm tasting the leaves, I'm tasting the kind of doughiness, like a, um, doesn't taste like a muscadet, but almost like a note from a muscadet, um, from maybe an older muscadet. That's fascinating. That's very interesting. Actually, you know, it's funny that, uh, now that I've, now that we've been doing this for a, uh, <laughs> for 55 minutes, that one actually probably should be colder. <laughs> uh, it's warmed up here. Uh, and it's the first one where I feel like if I were serving it, I almost always drink my whites at room temperature or a little just slightly below room temperature, just because they're so much more expressive. But if you were serving this to anyone tonight, I would, I would say that, you know, shouldn't be refrigerator temperature at all, but it should be a little bit cooler because it, 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 it's so broad and so rich that, uh, and just, it's kind of, it's kind of wide somehow. It's hitting my palate and just filling that way <laughs> rather than Toma More, which is filling this way. Um, I, I would cool it a little bit if you're gonna serve the rest of it, unless you've drunk it all at this point. <laughs> um, okay, let me get to, I know we're running short on time here. So let me get to some polls. Uh, and I think our next poll is just four versus five. And I'm glad you guys are voting because I'm not sure I can pick. I don't think I get to vote. No, I don't get to vote. <laughs> but I'm very curious to see what you're going to say. Dill is a great tasting note for that last one. Was that Lisa? Yeah, good call, Lisa. I should say also that if, if one of these styles is speaking to you um, more than the other, both of these producers make, you know, 
well, we from from Tomo More, we we get very very small allocations. We get quite a bit more from Boye, um, but both of them make lots of other wines uh, that are are um, delicious. Uh, both below Boye's Bourgogne uh, his entry level Bourgogne is is magnificent, um, and then his Premier Cru's you know are, are truly magnificent. Um, he lives in Merceau, so he doesn't have any Grand Cru's. Thomas Moray has um, Premier Cru's, the Chassagne Premier Cru's. He has a Pouligny Premier Cru, which is spectacular. And he also has a Grand Cru, actually, in Batard Morachet, um, which is lovely. Um, OK, look at that. In the poll, we've got, uh, whoops, am I sharing it? Yeah, I am sharing it. An even, even split, 15, 15, right down the middle. Well, I told you, I, I didn't have to. I'm not going to be the tiebreaker because I, I can't decide between them and Zoom won't let me. So, <laughs> um, great. Okay, so now uh, let's see. Stop sharing. So we got two more polls for you. So favorite overall, just the wine that hit you the best across these. Can't take credit for the tasting notes. Are all for my wife Robin. Okay, so credit to Robin then. <laughs> I like that one. Um, all right, so we've got these. And I, again, you know, with whites in particular, after the tasting, uh, after we sign off here, I encourage you to go back and forth between these because they will open up quite a bit. I actually think all of these benefited from the air that they got between, you know, ten when Allison and Isaiah opened these at the at the depot, and now when we're drinking them. So I think that was really good for all of them. Um, I think, uh, but but really, you know, with whites, it's really easy to go back and forth. So pour yourself a glass of each of these if there's any left in your in your. Uh, in your glass, in your bottles, uh, and really, you know, I think I think there's lots of interesting things happening in at least, particularly the first three that weren't happening when we were tasting them, and vice versa. You know, I'm sure once you do that, the four and five will jump out. All right, we'll end the poll here. We've got votes for everybody. Everybody got at least one vote. We've got the Chassagne winning by a nose. Merceau coming in second. Votes for the Saint Aubin, and then the Santenay and the Gros. All right, and the last one we'll do is the value one. So I'll give you the prices for these. Prices is very interesting for this one, actually. <laughs> um, all right, so the pricing, the Gros is 45, Bormont's 59, the Bellon's 45, the Chassagne from Moria is 69, and the Merceau from Bois is 75. Um, so that, you know, changes the, uh, changes the, uh, calculus a little bit, I think, or it should. Um, let's see, how many people chilled? Oh yeah, text in if you chilled these, uh, or if you didn't chill them, or how much you chilled them, or actually it just kind of chat in how you how you like to drink your white wines. You, you'll see, you know, if you're sitting here and you aren't chilling these over the course of an hour, and my apartment is, you know, not hot, but it's it's not cold, they, they definitely change as they warm up and they get much more kind of, you know, there's more of whatever you're tasting um, in all of them. Um, all right, so I'll give you a couple more seconds to chat in the, uh, which one you thought was the best value or favorite given the price, I should say. Chilled a half hour before, chilled for five, chilled for two, three, four, five. Yeah, the thing with, with white burgundy is when it gets to, when it gets closer to room temperature, it just gets so big <laughs> and soft and, and lovely, you know, and then, and people, people, you know, there, there are just things there are, you get things out of it that you wouldn't otherwise get almost more sometimes than you want <laughs> um all right let's see so we'll end the poll here this is a very even distribution for um the favorite value grow wins at 45 i agree it's a really good value at 45 up to the next to all the other ones that were that were uh less and then the bormon comes in second 59 uh, the Shasanya um, fifth, the Shasanya comes in next with six votes. So we've got seven votes, Grow, six votes, Bormon, five votes, Moray, then three each for the Boy and the Bellon. Excellent. All right. I will just share my screen one more time. And I will say, I forgot to say this two times ago and I got a lot of confused emails. So as usual, uh, as usual, uh, all of these wines, if any of them spoke to you and you want to put any in your own cellar, will be 15% off for 24 hours. You can use the code Zoom327 at checkout. Um, I will say that 
for a lot of these wines, uh, we have very low quantities, um, like less than, less, I think we have at least a case of all of them, but less than two cases for some of them. Um, so act quickly if you, if you uh, are interested. Uh, and then the next tastings we're doing, so next, the, the, the one big style, we didn't touch on any, um, didn't touch on any Makone wines, but the big style of white burgundy we didn't touch on today was Chablis. Um, and Chablis is, uh, you know, that big satellite region up there halfway between Dijon and Paris. Uh, and so for the next one, April tasting, we're going to do all Chablis at the village, Premier Cru and Grand Cru level. So that'll be really fun. And then on Saturday, we're going to do an interesting tasting, I'm very excited for, of organic and biodynamic reds from all over France. This is going to be kind of a grab bag. So we're going to go, we're going to be in the Alsace for the Pinot, Pinot Noir. Um, we're going to go down to Trouvelet and the Roussio for his Carignan, his new producer that's going to be coming in hopefully by May 22nd. <laughs> um, up to the Loire for a Cab Franc back to the Languedoc for another Carignan, or we might actually do a Syrah there, and then we'll do uh, Andre's Chasseneuve du Pop to round it out. So that'll be a really fun one too. But great, uh, this was, um, well, let's see, group call, should this have been chilled or not? One more poll. I can't do polls live. I have to set them up ahead of time, but next time I will, uh, I'll, I'll do, I'll send out an email poll for you guys. <laughs> um, but great, this was lots of fun. And thank you guys for joining me on a Saturday afternoon. If you have any questions, I'll send a follow-up email with these links so, so you don't need to, to write them down. But if you have any questions, don't hesitate to email me and uh, I hope you get outside, it's a lovely day. Hopefully the next one we do, the Chablis will be, you know, 78 degrees and sunny and, and we'll all be in t-shirts. Um, but have a nice rest of your weekend and uh, this was lots of fun. It's good to see you guys.